Hi, I'm Sean Munger, historian, author, podcaster, and teacher. On my website, seanmunger.com, where I teach history classes online, I'm offering a comprehensive audio course on the history of conspiracy theories in America. This class seeks to give a historical context and dive into the deep background of how and why conspiracy belief became so ingrained in American culture and how we got to the place we are now, where conspiracy theories and their believers are threatening the very basis of American democracy itself. The course consists of eight chapters. I've decided to put two of those here on YouTube for free as a teaser to demonstrate what the course is like. This video is the first of those two free chapters. In the sequence of eight classes, this one you're about to see is number two. It's titled Beginnings, Conspiracy Theories Before the 20th Century. In this chapter, I'll dive into the deep origins of conspiracy theory in Western culture, going all the way back to the Middle Ages, and especially European anti-Semitism. Then we move to colonial and revolutionary America, the foundation of particularly indelible conspiracy theories like the Illuminati, and how conspiracy theory wove its way through domestic and even foreign politics of the United States up through the end of the 19th century. The link to sign up for the class is in the description to this video. The course is $25, but you can also get it for signing up to access all my classes for $5 a month. Now, this is an audio-only course, so the video images are mostly placeholders, but I hope that from this you'll be able to get a sense of what the whole course is like. So here's Chapter 2 of Conspir the Conspiracy Theories in America course. Welcome back to our audio course on Conspiracy Theories in America. I'm Dr. Munger. This is session two in which we'll briefly summarize the ideas of conspiracies in America before the 20th century. This is necessarily going to be a very brief overview. As with everything in this course, there's so much that we could possibly cover in so much greater depth that most of what we're going to cover is a mile wide and an inch deep, so to speak. Conspiracy theories in America predate America, at least the European colonization of North America. Conspiracy theories are overwhelmingly anti-Semitic, and to find the roots of anti-Semitism, you have to go back to medieval Europe. The idea of blood libel, which is a type of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, stretches back to the beginnings of Christianity in Europe. Blood libel is the idea that Jews use the blood of Christians, particularly Christian children, in certain religious rituals, including the making of matzah for, Pas for Passover. In medieval Europe, the disappearances or murders of children would sometimes be blamed on local Jewish communities. Jews in most countries in medieval Europe were forced to live together in enclaves to which special laws applied. This is the origin of the concept and the word ghetto. In England, in 1144, a 12-year-old boy named William, who lived in Norwich, was found stabbed to death in the forest. The murder was blamed on local Jews. A cult of martyrdom grew up around William of Norwich. This is just one of several incidents in medieval Europe in which child deaths were blamed on Jews. King Edward I expelled all Jews from England in the year 1290. They were not permitted to return until after the English civil wars of the 17th century. Today, in online alt-right circles, the number 1290, which refers to this event, is used by neo-Nazis, especially in social media usernames. During the Black Death of the 14th century, there were frequent accusations that Jews or Jewish communities were deliberately spreading disease by poisoning local wells or by other means. Numerous Jewish communities were targeted by mobs of non-Jews who often burned down synagogues and forced Jews to flee. Erfurt, now in Germany, was a famous place where this happened in 1349. Martin Luther, the German monk who began the Reformation with his 95 Theses document in 1517, was a notorious anti-Semite. Toward the end of his life, Luther used the new technology of the printing press— which had greatly facilitated, and perhaps you could say even caused, the Protestant Reformation, to disseminate vitriolic anti-Semitic tracts, such as his book On the Jews and Their Lies, published in 1543. 
In this book, Luther argued that Jews should be expropriated of their property and even massacred. Some historians have claimed this book to be one of the conceptual foundations for the Holocaust. Still, this is mostly cultural background. When European countries, particularly Holland and England, began founding colonies in North America in the early 17th century, these attitudes, steeped in cultural memory and religious practice, came with the early colonists. But the simple fact was that there weren't very many Jews in colonial America, so the problem of anti-Semitism did not come up as often as it did in Europe. There were Jewish communities in the colonies from the beginning, but they were quite small. Believe it or not, the largest community of non-Christians in colonial America was Muslims, though virtually all Muslims in the colonies were slaves with roots in Africa. Moving away from the specific issue of anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking played a major role in the American Revolution, a much greater one than many people realize. Indeed, conspiracy theory was absolutely essential to the revolutionary project to break the colonies away from Great Britain. If you look closely, it's hard not to see the conspiracy views bleeding through the language of the Declaration of Independence. Most people remember the language at the beginning and end of the Declaration, but the bulk of it, in terms of word count, is contained in the Long Train of Abuses section, listing all the terrible things done by King George III against the American colonies. Among them are charges that can only be considered conspiracy theories, changing laws to stack the deck against colonists, robbing colonial legislatures of jurisdiction and powers, even a charge that George III was deliberately inciting violence on the frontier against colonists by Native American nations. Revolution-era colonial writers didn't stop at accusing King George of trying to oppress the colonies. Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor of Massachusetts, was identified, including by John Adams, as one of the architects of harsh British policies against the colonials. Another popular theory was that the Earl of Butte, John Stuart, who had been prime minister from 1762 to 63, was the secret head of Britain's anti-colonial cabal, and that even after he left office, he supposedly used his influence with the king to control the crown's policy toward America. Revolutionary patriots used secret or semi-secret societies to spread their ideology and machinate various parts of the revolution. The most famous of these was the Sons of Liberty, which was instrumental, for example, in enforcing boycotts against British merchants in response to the Stamp Act and the Intolerable Acts crises. While the Sons of Liberty weren't secret in the sense that they tried to pretend not to exist, members were supposed to conceal the fact of their membership from public view. Secret societies of this nature were very popular in Europe at this time. One of the most important ones, and which was to have an outsized role in American conspiracy theory lore, especially in modern times, was the Illuminati, founded in May 1776, just two months before American independence. The Illuminati was founded by Johann Adam Wieshaupt, a professor and philosopher who lived in Bavaria. Germany at that time was not a unified country, but a patchwork of independent states. Wieshaupt was a Jesuit. There was a lot of conspiracy lore in Europe about the Jesuits. But he was also a very enthusiastic devotee of what we now call the Enlightenment, the movement of intellectual and rationalistic thought that reached its heyday in Western Europe at the middle of the 18th century. Both the American and French revolutions were heavily steeped in Enlightenment ideas. Intellectual defenders of the American Revolution, like Thomas Jefferson, emitted a steady stream of opinion that recycled and built upon the ideas of Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke and Voltaire. The purpose of Wieshaupt's Illuminati Society was to promote equality, liberty, and rational thought throughout Europe and the world. He wanted to free humankind from the shackles of government and organized religion. Wieshaupt was also, for a time, a Freemason, and his Illuminati borrowed heavily from Masonic traditions and ideas. The cloak and dagger stuff, secret members and rituals, all of that came from Masonic lore. This is despite the fact that Wieshaupt was dissatisfied with Freemasonry, thinking that it wasn't radical or progressive enough for his taste. 
Partially because of the cloak and dagger stuff, the Illuminati looked incredibly sinister. It wasn't. In reality, the Illuminati accomplished very little. At its height, the Illuminati had probably no more than 650 members, most of them university students and other Freemasons. Vieshaupt's writings got the organization banned, along with all other secret societies, in 1785 by the Elector of Bavaria, Karl Theodor, and the Illuminati ceased to exist after that time. Vieshaupt continued to write about his ideas for years afterward until his death in 1830. Hold this thought, the Illuminati will come up again in our class. What really energized conspiracy thinking in the new United States was not the American Revolution, but the French Revolution. This is a little bit ironic. Both revolutions came directly out of the political and social thought of the Enlightenment, and the French Revolution, which began in 1789, expressly adopted the language and rhetoric of the American. However, the American Revolution was different in character. It was a political revolution only, directed mostly from the top down by a revolutionary elite, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, etc. The effect of the revolution was carefully limited to leave the social and economic order in the colonies, especially its landed aristocracy, like Washington and Jefferson, untouched. The French Revolution was much more of a social revolution. There was a political component to it, of course, but it was much less under the control of a revolutionary elite. The people of France wanted to overturn the whole social and economic order. Everything was on the table. Aristocratic privilege, the favored position of the church, social mores, everything. This was deeply alarming to conservatives in other countries in Europe and also in the new United States. A great deal of American politics at the national level in the 1790s had to do with America's reaction to the upheaval of the French Revolution. Should the new nation embrace it or fear it? This tension crystallized into a ferocious partisan fight between the first political parties, the Federalists, who were generally anti-French Revolution, and the Democratic Republicans, who tended to embrace the Revolution's ideals more openly. The 1796 and particularly 1800 presidential elections, both of which involved Federalist John Adams, were basically about this argument. In 1798, the year the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed in the United States, which criminalized dissent against the government in flagrant violation of the First Amendment, a French writer, Abbé de Barral, published a book called Memoirs Illustrating the History of Jacobinism. This book wasn't well known in the U.S., but it definitely set the blueprint for American conspiracy thinking for the next 200 years. In this book, Bahuel said that the French Revolution was a giant plot fomented by Freemasons, the Jacobins, another secret society in France, and, of course, Vieshaupt's Illuminati. The point was to overthrow Christianity. Baruel also associated these secret societies with alleged occult practices, harking back to the medieval blood libel legends, although Bahuel's memoirs was not explicitly anti-Semitic. Oh, I should mention, Bahuel was a former Jesuit. Remember what I said in the first session, that conspiracy theory is a theory about how history works. Bahuel's book was the first explication of that sort of theory, it made its accusations in a historical context and charged that the actors who brought about the French Revolution had been conspiring for decades. Baruel influenced another of what you might call counter-enlightenment thinkers, John Robeson, a British physicist. About the same time that Baruel was writing, Robeson wrote a book called Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe, carried on in the secret meetings of Freemasons, Illuminati, and reading societies. This book made basically the same argument, raging against the Freemasons particularly, and accusing the Illuminati of having corrupted them. Robeson wrote in English in his book, originally published in 1797, Got Play in America. Jedediah Morse was one of the most influential people in the early Republic. A theologian, geographer, and writer, and the father of Samuel Morse, who invented the telegraph, Jedediah Morse's thinking influenced many aspects of American culture in this period. 
His teachings on geography, for example, fueled the view of many Americans that they were somehow destined to control the entire North American continent, to the exclusion of Native Americans, the idea of manifest destiny. Anyway, in 1798, Jedediah Morse began preaching in New England about the evils of the Illuminati and the French Revolution. He drew his material directly from John Robeson's book and his sermons on the Illuminati, were largely responsible for injecting this conspiracy theory into the bloodstream of American culture. Jedediah Morse is the first of our real vectors of conspiracy theory in American history, and he ranks right up there with Charles Coughlin and Alex Jones. Many Americans are surprised to learn that conspiracy theories about the Illuminati have been around since the 1790s, but they have been. And, at least in Morse's formation of them, they appear to have had a political objective. Morse was a strong, committed Federalist. The possibility of war with France was a major issue in American politics between 1798 and the election of 1800. The conspiracy theory had the effect of motivating American voters against the Democratic Republicans, the party led by Thomas Jefferson, who had spoken and written supportively of the French Revolution and its ideals. Of course, Jefferson did win that election, but only after the dramatic vote by the House of Representatives in February 1801 that chose him as president over Aaron Burr. The popular press hashed a lot of conspiracy theory about Jefferson himself. The charge that he was a secret atheist who would abolish religion was an especially popular one. Most of the conspiracy theories in the 1820s and 30s involved Masons, which, as we've already seen, have been a lightning rod of conspiracy thinking. But the next big wave of conspiracy theories concerned Catholics. In 1835, Samuel Morse, yes, Jedediah's son, wrote a book called Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, which proved the apple didn't fall far from the tree. In this book, the younger Morse raged at the Habsburg dynasty of Austria, which he said was planning to take over the U.S. using the Jesuits to infiltrate society. Austria was a Catholic country and the fear of Catholicism tapped into long-held attitudes by American Protestants that Catholics were a pernicious force opposed to the values of the American Republic. Fears and conspiracy theories about Catholic plots to take over America gained a lot of currency, with a huge wave of immigration into the United States from Ireland in the 1840s. The vast majority of these immigrants were Catholic. The tensions among immigrants and more long-settled residents of the United States were especially bad in large cities like Boston and New York. Most Irish immigrants entered large port cities and then didn't move very far, accounting for the huge growth of Irish ethnic neighborhoods in these cities in the mid-19th century. General anti-Catholic sentiment and conspiracy theories about Catholics gave rise to a political movement, usually referred to as nativism, which reached its peak in the 1850s, just before the Civil War. The Native American Party, founded in 1844 in Philadelphia, where there had notably been several anti-Catholic riots that required militia troops to quell, had nothing to do with what we think of today as Native Americans, meaning indigenous peoples of the Americas. The quote-unquote natives of the 1840s and 50s were white Protestants, mostly of Anglo-Saxon origin. The Native American Party was anti-immigration and virulently anti-Catholic, and it was built on a conspiracy theory. The idea that rank-and-file Catholics were obeying the Pope, who had a secret plan to subvert American democracy and the Protestant religion. They were called Know-Nothings because the party was supposed to be a secret society, and when any outsider asked a member anything specific about the party, the member was supposed to say, I know nothing. In fact, by the mid-1850s, the party, which had changed its name to the American Party, was much more popularly known as the the Know-Nothing Party. The American Party managed to elect some state and federal officials in the 1840s and 50s, and their members raised plenty of havoc, causing riots in urban areas and even burning down Catholic churches on some occasions. Its success was linked in part to the splintering of the two major political parties in the United States, the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, in the 1850s over slavery, 
the Whigs actually disbanded. Many of their members, at least those who were anti-slavery, regrouped as the new Republican Party. But those for whom anti-immigration was a bigger issue defected to the Know-Nothings. The most high-profile supporter of the Know-Nothing Party was former President Millard Fillmore. He had come to power as president in 1850 as a member of the Whig Party upon the death of Zachary Taylor. But once he was out of office, he tried to run for president in his own right in 1856. He was more or less drafted by the Know-Nothings, but Fillmore did apparently support some aspects of their platform. He lost, of course. Democrat James Buchanan was elected that year, and the fuse burned down closer to civil war, which broke out in 1861 after the election of Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to skip over a couple of decades, but understand that none of this sentiment ever really went away. Conspiracy theories never do, they just change form. In the late 1880s, a new secret society was formed in Iowa to battle the perceived political influence of Catholics. This was the American Protective Association, and it trafficked in conspiracy theories just as the know-nothings had. In the case of the APA, it hyped a fake document, purportedly issued by Pope Leo XIII, that called upon Catholics around the world to exterminate heretics, meaning Protestants, on September 5, 1893. The early 1890s were a tumultuous period in American history and fertile ground for conspiracy theorizing, mainly because of an economic collapse, the Panic of 1893, which was the worst economic crisis in U.S. history up until that time. Even before that, there was a lot of controversy in the U.S. over money and currency issues. Price deflation after the Civil War especially hurt small farmers in the West and Midwest, most of whom borrowed money to buy their farms. Government policy in this period endlessly hashed over how money should be handled and how much of it should be backed by gold and silver. The People's Party, or Populist Party, became powerful in the early 1890s, by appealing to many people, especially those Midwestern and Western farmers, who thought they were getting screwed by the system. The government, in league with banks in big cities on the East Coast, and big corporations, especially railroads, who constantly got bailouts from the government. You can see how this would attract conspiracy thinking. The ideas that politicians and Eastern bankers were conspiring to manipulate the money system, so as to bankrupt farmers and pick up their land on the cheap, these ideas were key to the populists' electoral successes, which reached a high watermark in 1892. The populists were somewhat co-opted by the nomination at the 1896 Democratic Convention of William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska for president. Bryan stole the thunder of the populists and incorporated a lot of their themes into his own campaign. Notably, Bryan was also a pretty extreme fundamentalist Christian, as would later be displayed by his participation in the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee, where a science teacher was prosecuted for teaching the theory of evolution. Bryan lost, of course, but the victory of his opponent, William McKinley, a Republican, seemed to signify the end of populist politics and the triumph of those same big-moneyed Eastern bank and corporation interests that the populists had been warning everybody about. Conspiracy theory and its modes of thinking had a bit of a heyday, though, during the McKinley administration itself, particularly regarding the Spanish-American War. There was a long run-up to this war sparked by desires to have the United States gain a stake in the game of great power imperialism that was then going on, and it was fueled by the rise of the popular press, sensationalist newspapers like those run by Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. This was the era of what's often called yellow journalism. In January 1898, the battleship USS Maine was sent to Havana Harbor in Cuba, one of Spain's last remaining colonial possessions, supposedly to safeguard American interests there. On February 15th, the Maine blew up while at anchor, killing 261 servicemen, about two-thirds of the crew. The explosion was probably caused by the ignition of dust in a coal bunker, but the press trumpeted conspiracy theories that it had been a Spanish mine or sabotage, and downplayed the accident hypothesis. 
The explosion of the main and widespread sentiment in the U.S. that it had somehow been the work of Spain, a conspiracy theory, was largely responsible for mounting political support for direct intervention of the United States into Cuba. In April 1898, the U.S. declared war on Spain. As a result of the war, the United States gained control of the Philippines, Spain's largest remaining colonial possession, though the U.S. did not take control of Cuba directly. The Spanish-American War is in many ways a high watermark of the influence of conspiracy theories in legitimate American politics. In the next session, we'll turn our attention to the first half of the 20th century. This is the end of Session 2 of Conspiracy Theories in America. Thanks for listening. So, I hope you enjoyed and learned something from this chapter of the Conspiracy Theories in America course. If you're interested in the whole thing, as I said at the beginning, it's available on my website, seanmunger.com, for $25. Or it's included in the package if you sign up to access all of the courses on my site for $5 a month, and you can cancel at any time. I'm not trying to get rich from this, I'm just hoping to share some historical insight and context on some issues that vitally concern the future of our democracy. I'll be putting one additional chapter of the class online as well. That will be chapter five. Check out my other videos here on YouTube, especially my historical thoughts series, and subscribe, like, do all that stuff that you normally do for a video that you like. Thanks for watching.